Hi, this is Frid from The Joy of Syntax and English in Color. Today, I want to discuss dangling prepositional phrases with you. In particular, dangling prep phrases when they function as predicate appositives. And for that purpose, I have prepared a very nice PowerPoint for you. Here it is. Yummy bite slice study units. Okay. Okay, what's a prep phrase? Let's quickly review. A prep phrase is simply a construction that contains a prep phrase that is followed by a noun or a noun phrase. And I know that some people never talk about nouns, but they simply refer to noun phrases, but that's uh, an issue for another day. So noun-like structures, so nouns, noun phrases, gerunds, gerund constructions, and nominal clauses. And here is an example. This is a picture of my sweetheart, Rudolph, the black-nosed canine, my canine companion and fur baby. Right now he's sleeping on his bed on the floor, those are prep phrases, but yesterday and this morning he was sleeping on my bed. On is a preposition and my bed is a noun phrase consisting of the head noun bed and the possessive adjective my and some people call this a possessive determiner. Okay, so this is a very, very simple um, prep phrase as adverbial of place. Where is Rudolph? Where, where is he? He is lying on my bed. Okay, what? Let me move myself out of the way here. Okay, let's look at functions that prep phrases can have. They can be bound and free modifiers. They can be clause elements, like in this previous example, um, on my bed was an, a prep phrase as adverbial of place. Um, and they can be predicate appositives and they can be reduced clauses. And today I wanted to discuss them mostly as predicate appositives, or rather when things have gone awry and they're meant to be predicate appositives, but they dangle. Uh, let's quickly review what a predicate appositive is. A predicate appositive is basically a second predicate, but a non-finite or verbless one that has been placed alongside of the finite predicate. We could also say that it is a um, second or that it is simply a, a predicate complement that has been placed alongside of a main clause or a subclause. Um, Okay, and careful, predicate complement is the traditional term. It's the term that my hero, George Kern, uses. I love this grammar. Everybody needs to have one of those, every nerd. Um, and now modern grammars call these structures by different names, but they mean the same thing. Huddleston and Pullum call them predica uh, predicative complement. Um, Longman, hang on, let me move that out of the way. Longman the Longman grammar of um, spoken and written English um, calls it a subject predicative. Some people say predicative, or but I say predicative. Um, and then um, Cork calls these structures complements to the subject. But I'm going to use the traditional term. Okay. Here are examples of prep phrases as predicate positives. Um, the most straightforward cases are um, these, where the predicate appositive simply follows the main clause. She returned to the house, we have our intransitive verb, we have our adverbial, and then we have this thing that looks like uh, um, simply a clause element, and it is this, this second predicate, but it's an, but it's an non-finite predicate, or in this case, even a verbless. Um, uh, I mean, yes, a verbless predicate. She was in tears and she returned to the house. Or while she was in tears, she returned to the house. They entered the house as friends. So when they entered the house, they were still like friends. 
As a true friend, he stood by me to the end. Among the poorest people on the continent, they were freely loading me up with provisions. The first three examples are taken from this book, from George Kerm. Um, and the last is an example that is quoted by the wonderful Virginia Tuft in her wonderful, artful sentences. I love this book. Thank you, Virginia, for writing it. Um, okay. So, and by the way, um, there is a wonderful companion book, which I only have in copy because it's not available in print anymore. It's called Grammar as Style Exercises in Creativity. And that's the companion book that was made for the first edition of this book. And it's by Gary Stewart and Virginia Taft. And it is wonderful. They need to print that again because it's just a treasure. But that's a different story. I just wanted to tell you that I didn't make these examples up. I, I usually use a native speaker prose and I try to use fantastic prose. Okay. Um, there we go. So, what is the rule for a successful predicate appositive? Uh, the rule is very simple. Every predicate appositive has an implied subject, and this implied subject must be identical with the subject that is stated in the clause to which the predicate appositive has been attached. Easy peasy. Yet, even though this is so easy, this rule often gets violated. But once you're aware of it, you won't ever violate it again. At least you'll catch it when you do your revisions. Okay, let me give you a successful example and an unfortunate example. As the editorial director for, and I left out the publishing house, the name of the publishing house in order not to tattle, I am often asked how we acquire books. Oops, there's a little bit of a big space there. Ignore that, please. But um, as the editorial director for, mm -hmm, I am often asked how we acquire books. This is fine. Clearly, the, the subject of the main clause is the editorial director for this publishing house. And in that capacity, she is often asked a question. Now, as a publisher, that's usually an easy answer. Well, that refers to the answer, to the answer that she gives to that question. And the answer is not the publisher. So clearly here we have a dangler on our hands. This introductory prep phrase is supposed to function as predicate a positive, but it dangles. There's a disconnect between this structure and the clause to which it has been attached. Okay, so let's try to fix it. Now, in this case, I would actually simply leave this out and continue on. So instead of saying as a publisher, that's usually an easy answer since most of our manuscripts come in through agents directly, blah, blah, blah. I would actually simply ditch this and correct like this. I find most of our manuscripts through agents and through our self-publishing imprint. And of course, I'm also constantly on the lookout for new and amazing content. That's how I would fix it. When you have more context, you can, of course, become more creative. But we don't always need to simply ditch the dangling phrase. We can also simply correct the main clause and bring the true subject into the actual subject position. Here is another example of a dangler, but as a plant-based wellness coach. So somebody is a wellness coach here. Many of the recipes I fall in love with. So look at this. The true important semantic subject is not the subject of the main clause, but is hidden in the defining relative clause of the subject. So many of the recipes, not all of the recipes, but many, many is a pronoun, post modified by a prep phrase of the recipes. So Many of the recipes that I fall in love with, because it's a contact clause, we can leave out the relative pronoun and we have the uh, this um, contact relative clause I fall in love with, that I fall in love with. Okay, now, three problems with this sentence. The first one is that here we have a dangler. The second problem is that the coordinating conjunction but actually is part of the main clause. And so this subject, um, this predicate, a positive needs to be inserted in comma. So we need a comma here. 
and there is a coordinating conjunction, a correlative coordinating conjunction here, a correlative conjunction. And the rule is you always place these two elements in front of the same types of structures. So we need to have parallel structure. But the first item here is followed by a verb and the second item is followed by a noun. That's not nice, as all writing teachers will tell you. Let's fix this. But, comma, as a plant-based wellness coach, I find many recipes that contain animal products or other unhealthy ingredients. In this case, we didn't need a correlative conjunction. We could simply ditch the either. In other cases, you need to either come up with a verb then or rearrange the sentence in other ways. But I thought this was the easiest fix. Now, here, um, when these predicate positives are in introductory position like that, they sometimes take on a little bit of a causal, um, causal flair. And um, somehow I think there is a little bit of a connect, disconnect um, just because she's a wellness coach, um, plant-based wellness coach, doesn't mean that she necessarily comes across these recipes or is on the lookout for them. So why don't we add something? As a plant-based wellness coach, I'm always looking for new recipes, but many of the recipes I fall in love with contain animal products or other unhealthy ingredients that don't meet my health goals. What do I do? And here's another option we can say, I am a plant-based wellness coach who is always looking for new recipes, but many of the recipes I fall in love with contain animal products or other unhealthy ingredients that don't meet my health goals. Goals. What do I do? Okay, so we have, um, I have experimented with various ways of fixing this problem. You can become totally creative. The main thing is that you, you bring the implied subject of the predicate positive into alignment with the true subject of the clause to which it has been attached. Okay, here is another example. As coaches soon, soon to be coaches, why is this important? Okay, again, clearly, this is not identical with coaches and soon to be coaches. So something is important for someone for a reason. That's the underlying structure of the this whole sentence. So let's clean this up. And in this case, I would really ditch the prep phrase and simply say, why is this important for us coaches and soon to be coaches? And a little side note here, um, this prep phrase for us coaches and soon to be coaches modifies important. So it might be unimportant for, for soccer players and important for coaches and soon to be coaches or unimportant for dogs and important for coaches. So this prep phrase clearly modifies the importance, the, the adjective important. And us is a, a pronoun and coaches and soon to be coaches is a noun phrase, a compound noun phrase that functions as a restrictive, a positive modifying us. So if I just say, uh, if the speaker had said, why is this important for us? Then people might not have known that he is referring uh, to collectively to a group of coaches and soon to be coaches. So he makes that clear by using this restrictive, restricted, um, restrictive, a positive. But that's um, a side note. Okay, a final example. As a current subscriber, we, off we are offering you the option of extending your present subscription at the current low rates. Now, clearly the people that are offering um, the present subscription at the current low rates are not the subscribers. So there is again a dangling situation here and we can easily correct this one as a current subscriber you have the option of extending your present subscription at the current low rates. Now, um, to wrap this up, I wanted to give you an example of a dangling prep phrase that is actually not a, pres a, pres a pres predicate a positive. Like so many of my clients, my path to wellness got off to a bumpy start. I hope you all hear that there's a disconnect between the prep phrase of comparison and my path. Now, Let's fix this. It's easy. Um, like so many of my clients, so 
here we have comparison between somebody and his or her clients. Where is the somebody? It's actually the I, which the I is implied here in this main clause, but not stated. And we made the I visible now in this sentence. Like so many of my clients, I began my path to wellness with a bumpy start. Okay, that's it for today. And if you enjoyed this, you might enjoy my book, my grammar book, The Joy of Syntax and the Zen of Grammar Practice, which is actually a colorful book. It's printed in color. I don't know whether you can see that here, that I de designed a color parsing method and I explained that in my book. And then I apply that to style and um, and texts, real texts. Uh, I, I had a lot of fun writing it. I'm going to have a lot of fun teaching with it. And you might have a lot of fun reading it. Um, and please visit me on my website. I offer a lot of cool freebies and, um, and blogs and information. And I'd love to have you as a subscriber and a fan. <laughs> so stay tuned. And uh, I'm going to try hard to come up with a new and cool video soon. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.